My word doesn't change, and the meaning behind the words in my word doesn't change. So if it meant it at the time of Moses, then it also means the same thing today. God's word is God's word forever. So that's what we're going to look at, is what does that mean? And we're going to look at what Paul says and what Jesus says. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says this. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So in the midst of this, Paul is speaking a little bit about appetites. And the question is, what runs you? Do your appetites run you, or do you run your appetites? My wife and I, when we were ever in Brookfield, uh, we always loved to stop by Portillo's. How many of you love Portillo's in here? You love Portillo's? If you've never gone to Portillo's, you need to go to Portillo's. Not just because it's a taste of Chicago, but it's really good food too. So, so I love Portillo's. When we go there, we always order the same thing because it's just how I am. I really never change that way. And so I always get an Italian beef sandwich with mozzarella cheese on. My wife gets the Italian beef with mozzarella cheese and then she ruins it by putting hot peppers on it. And uh, so, so we get our sandwiches and then we get our sodas and we get one large fry. And I think that's probably our problem is we get one large fry because when we get the bag, and then Delina hands me the large fry, and I put the large fry uh, between my legs as I'm driving so I can drive and eat at the same time. And, and, but she tells me, always says the same thing, don't eat them all. Yeah, that doesn't work. I love Portillo's french fries. Those are so good. So at some point, usually it's when my finger hits the bottom of the french fry box, and I realize there's four french fries left. I go, here, I didn't eat them all. And I hand up to her and she goes, you might as well have, right? I just, I just can't help it. I just can't help it. I love those french fries. I just can't help letting my appetite run me instead of having me run my appetite. That's what Paul would say. Are you running your appetites? Or are you allowing your appetites, what you want, what you like, what you desire, to run you. I just can't help it. I can't control myself. And God reminds us that our appetites are not always good because we're sinners and we choose the wrong thing. It's like with your children. If you would give your children the option to have whatever they wanted for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, many of them would pick chocolate cake. Right? Like, I just want chocolate cake for three meals a day. That's good. Or pick your favorite dessert, candy. And you as a parent know that is not good for you. Maybe that works for a day, but pretty soon the sugar high and then the sugar low and, and it's just not good for your health. Like, so your appetite cannot run you. I need to help you understand what's a good appetite. This is what God is saying. We cannot allow our appetites to run us in reference to the sixth commandment. But we need to understand that we need to control those appetites. And we can't do it on our own. It is only in understanding what the Holy Spirit does and whose we are. And what God created us for. And so he goes on in speaking about that, that our appetites can't run us. He says this, do you not know that your bodies thus are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. As a dad, I have learned that kitchen tables, glue, and paper don't go together. It is the worst combination of items ever. And so there are times where our, my children will, will love to do art projects. They love to color and use glitter and glue and scissors and paper. And they'll have it out on our wooden dinner table. And in the midst of that, they're not paying attention. And they take the glue and the paper and they glue the paper to the table. And have you ever tried to remove paper that is glued to a wooden dinner table? It does not go well. 
Because you rip that, tape, that piece of paper off and what happens? Some of the paper stays there, doesn't it? Because it's been joined. And because it's been joined to something it should not be joined to and stays there, then in order to try to get it off, you, you take a knife or you take a, a, a blade and you try to scrape it off without scraping your table, which also doesn't work so well. And either way, either the paper is hurt or the table is hurt because something that wasn't supposed to be joined together was joined together. This is what Paul is saying. He said, don't be joined together with something that you ought not be joined together with because in the end, someone's going to get hurt. And sometimes it's both. Saying, I, I have something better for you. I have a greater picture for what marital relationships and healthy relationships should look like. Don't be joined to something that you ought not to be joined with. And then at the end, he finishes it. Therefore, because you don't want to be joined with it because of the pain that it will cause, flee from sexual immorality. One of my favorite pictures of this in Scripture is from Genesis chapter 39. It's the story of Joseph. Many of you know the story of Joseph, especially the story of Joseph with the coat of many colors. Well, Joseph was sold into slavery uh, into Egypt, and he was sold to Potiphar. Potiphar was a high-ranking official in the household of Pharaoh. And Joseph starts as a slave, but because of how good of a household manager he is, his integrity, how God blesses him, how God speaks through him, Joseph gets raised in rank to basically just under Potiphar, to the point you'll hear it in something I'll read in a moment, that Potiphar gives everything to Joseph except his wife. He says, says you have everything. Uh, I give you control, power, authority over everything. And this is what it says about Joseph. So it says, so Joseph um, left all that he had, or, or Potiphar left all that he had in charge of jo or Joseph's charge. And because of it, Joseph, Potiphar had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, so she took notice of him, and said, come and lie down with me. But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. He has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything back from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God. Do you notice how, who, he said, who Potiphar said he would sin against? He doesn't say, how can I do this thing and, and, and Potiphar has given me everything and, and how can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar? That's not what he says. He goes, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? That's what Paul's saying, isn't it? He's saying, if you've been joined with the Lord, then the sin of the sixth commandment is one of disobedience against the Lord first. It's against him. And he goes and says, flee sexual immorality, which is why then what happens with Joseph is that eventually he's alone in Potiphar's house with Potiphar's wife. Uh, we believe it was probably Potiphar's wife sent all of the servants out of the house knowing Joseph was going to come over to do what Potiphar had told him to do with taking care of the household and, and sends everything out and says, come and lie down with me. And, and he goes, I can't do this. And she grabs onto his, his cloak or his jacket you can think of. But at that time, usually that's all they would wear is that outer cloak because of how hot it was. And as he runs, she pulls it off of him, but he just keeps going because he is fleeing sexual immorality. He says, I, I don't even want to be near this. He flees it. Now he gets in trouble because Potiphar's wife lies about it and blames him for it. But because of his integrity, God blesses him and eventually rises in the household of Pharaoh. But flee sexual immorality. Run away from it. Jesus speaks in the same language we hear in our gospel reading. Matthew 5, Jesus said, you have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So lest we go, now well, that's absolutely right. So for those that are living with each other before marriage and those who are committing adultery and those are, yeah. Jesus hits at the heart of everyone and says, if you don't just act, but think. Not just action, but intention. He says, you've already done it in your heart, then you've already done it. And it's sin. 
It's not just action, but intention. It's a little bit like this. My family and I, uh, we have a, a brown lab at home. Not the smartest animal in the world, but we still love it, or our children still love this animal. And there are some times where my wife and I will decide after, after dinner, we'll have a late night snack, we'll take it out into the living room, put it on the coffee table, I'll go and get a drink, I'll come back out there, and guess where the dog's nose is? This far from the food, right? And I will look at the dog and I will say to that dog, don't you even think about it. You ever said that before? So we're like, to my children all the time, don't you even think about it. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't even think about it. It's not even just the action, but it's the intention that is the sin. It's the thought, you know, I would if I could. If I could get away with it, I would do it. He says, no, don't. And then he goes on and says, so if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better to lose one of your members than the whole body be thrown into hell. Saying, get rid of it. Throw it away. Saying, if you struggle with viewing images on your computer or your iPad or your cell phone, and you're tempted to continually pull up websites that you shouldn't be pulling up, then turn it off. Or get an accountability partner that can help you to make sure that you're no longer going to those websites or viewing those images on your phone or on your, on your uh, computer anymore. See, if there's a relationship in your life that is tempting you away from a husband or a wife, or tempting you in a way that ought not to be, you might need to end that relationship. Cut it off. It is better to cut it off than to be led away from the life that God would have you live. Because God has a picture for what healthy relationships ought to look like, and he says if anything is taking you away from it, get rid of it. Throw it away. And then Paul finishes with the picture of ownership. He says, flee from sexual immorality. For every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And he's going to speak now about why that is significant. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. He says, you don't own you. God does. He made you, he created you, and he bought you. He purchased you with his very own blood. He suffered and died for you. And in this world today, we many times think, well, I can just do whatever I want. I can live however I want. It's my body. I can do with my body what I want. Paul reminds us, it is not your body, and you don't get a choice with it because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And can you join that which is to be holy, a temple of the Holy Spirit, with things that are unholy? Absolutely not. Because God does not want holiness and unholiness to be joined together. Or think of it this way. How should I use my body if I realize that the Holy Spirit dwells within me? How should I live? What should I look at on the internet? How should I treat the men and women that are around me in my life? How should I live according to the sixth commandment if my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? But I love how he ends. He ends with the gospel, doesn't he? He says, because you were bought with a price. Because here's a truth that I know as well, and you do too that none of us can keep this commandment. None of us. We do a really good job wagging our fingers at others in the, the view of these great sins that we think of in other people's lives, but the truth is is that we should really be pointing the finger at ourselves first because none of us can keep this commandment well. And Jesus reminds all of us, Paul reminds all of us, you were bought with a price. Jesus suffered and died so that even when you break this commandment, you might know that he has redeemed you and he has loved you and he has paid the price for your sin so that having been bought back and repurified again, you might glorify God with your body. See, the picture Jesus paints for us in Scripture, because some people will say, well, well, okay, Paul talks about this, the Old Testament talks about it. I don't know that Jesus really talks about this. Jesus does talk about this, Matthew chapter 19. 
In Matthew chapter 19, in speaking about divorce, Jesus responds and says, yes, uh, Moses said you can give someone a certificate of divorce and be divorced, but that's not the way it always was because from the very beginning, God created them male and female, and then he, he joined together male and female, husband and wife, so that the two might become one. Jesus is very clear about that. Husband, wife, male, female, that's the picture of marriage from Jesus. It's the boundary. It's God's picture for a marital relationship. And anything inside of that boundary honors God, glorifies God with our body. But anything that is outside of that boundary is sin. And when you understand that, anything outside of that is sin. He does not look at any one of those individual sins as greater than another. Whether it is homosexuality, or it is premarital, or it is adultery outside of marriage, or it is looking at someone else lustfully, or it is any other sin of the Sixth Commandment. There is no gold star around any of those sins. They are all equal, and they all cause us to fall short of the glory of God. But I want you to think about how Jesus handled that then. How did Jesus handle those who broke the Sixth Commandment? The woman who was caught in the act of adultery who was thrown at Jesus' feet. Did he wag the finger at her? Did he cast her away? Did he talk about her behind her back? Did he go, man, I really wish that this culture would just get itself together. Look at how terrible this is. No, he stooped down next to her. And he says, they have not condemned you, neither have I condemned you. But he added, therefore go and sin no more. He spoke the truth, but he spoke it in compassion and love. Or the woman at the well, who comes there and he goes, yes, I know that, that uh, you don't just have one husband, you've had many husbands, and the person you're with now isn't even your husband. And she goes and she tells everybody about Jesus. Why? Because did he wag the finger at her? Did he push her away? Did he start talking about her? Did he demean her? No. He spoke truth, but he spoke truth in love. Why? Because this is the amazing grace of a God who loves us so much that he would pay the price for us. You see, you are not your own. God has bought you. He has purchased you. No matter how far you have fallen short of the glory of God, he bought you with a price so that you might glorify God with your body, so that we might not give in to the appetites of this world, so that we might not be glued together with unholiness, but we might know the freedom that comes with knowing that we are loved and owned, purchased and bought back by a Savior who has given his very life for you and for me. However you struggle, not others, but however you struggle with this commandment, you were bought with a price. Glorify God with your body. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is easy in the midst of this commandment to look at the world around us and where it's at. And yet, when you spoke words of truth, they were words that we needed to hear, not just others. They were words that were directed so that we might look at our own sin and brokenness so that we might know that we need a Savior who would buy us with the price of his very life. So thank you for giving your life for us. Thank you for loving us, no matter how far we fall short of the glory of God. Thank you, God, for the opportunity we have to speak these words of truth and love into the lives of others. May we not give in to our appetites. Help us not to be glued together with things that we ought not to be stuck to, but help us to glorify you with our bodies, knowing that you purchased us with a price. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give to you his everlasting peace. Amen.